Two, two, Tootsie, goodbye. This is television. This is real. Pardon my French, but you're an asshole. 1990 to 1991 was the season for failed sitcoms based on successful movies. Let's take count, shall we? There was Parenthood, which lasted for 12 episodes on NBC. Working Girl, which lasted 8 episodes also on NBC. Then there was Uncle Buck, which I've covered before, which somehow lasted 14 episodes on CBS. Who's living life to his own kind of rhythm? It's Uncle Buck! Shit! There was also Baby Talk, based on Look Who's Talking, which ran for two seasons starting in spring of 91. And those are just the ones that made it to series. But sadly, Uncle Buck wouldn't be the most shameless attempt to turn a John Hughes movie into a sitcom that TV season. Ooh, there's a shocker! <laughs> For just weeks prior to that show's first episode, rival network NBC gave us Ferris Bueller. Ferris Bueller! The series, which had no participation from anyone involved in the movie, debuted strong in August 1990. But negative reviews led to dwindling ratings, and it was cancelled after just 13 episodes. Sayonara, Sonny. While I'll at least give the Uncle Buck sitcom credit for trying to emulate elements that made that movie a hit, Ferris Bueller is a fascinating case study, though, for just how much it seemed to hate its source material. Not only did the pilot episode open like this, but the show also transplanted the characters from suburban Chicago to Santa Monica, because surely the former location had nothing to do with the identity of Ferris Bueller. I love LA. It. The show fell victim to a lazy trope that so many cash grab follow ups fall into, acknowledging the events of the source material, in this case the original movie, as fiction, with the sitcom being the real story. Matthew Broderick as me. No way. Yeah, that's me. Despite the fact that the TV show aired four years after the movie, when this Ferris wouldn't have even been in high school yet. You were always old, but everyone was once young and goofy. You would think changing the setting would at least allow the writers to tell new types of stories, but there was just only so much they could do with these characters. I mean, not every day could be a day off for Ferris Bueller, so we get riveting scenes of him attending class. Okay, the space bar. No, that's not where you stop for a drink on your way to Mars. <laughs> the space bar advances your cursor. Now. At the time, NBC president Brandon Tartikoff predicted the show would be, quote, the hottest show ever. And if they told you Wolverines would make good house pets, would you believe them? So how did a show with such high promise end up becoming one of the biggest sitcom failures of all time? Let's take a look. Sorry. Nobody said this was going to be pretty. Believe it or not, this sitcom would not have existed based on the success of the movie alone, but rather due to another unrelated sitcom that was in production at the same time. You've cut first period all year. Clean out your locker, you're finished. Okay, maybe unrelated is a stretch, as Parker Lewis Can't Lose was directly inspired by Ferris Bueller's Day Off. How would you like a night of mystery with a high school junior? Who's not bad looking, actually intelligent? And who hasn't done a bad thing to anyone? I'm starting to believe this myself. When Paramount got wind of the fact that Columbia Pictures was working on a show inspired by their hit movie, they decided to beat them to the punch and make an actual Ferris Bueller sitcom, rushing it to air before Parker Lewis. I'll overlook your faulty judgment. Back to class, chop chop. Thank you, sir. So, in a weird turn of events, the show isn't trying to be like the movie, but rather trying to be like an unrelated show that was trying to be like the Ferris Bueller movie. How's that for being born under a bad sign? In watching the 13 episodes, there are a couple of things I'll have to give this show credit for. For starters, not making it a standard three-camera studio audience sitcom was a great choice. The multi-cam format, especially in 1990, feels really fresh. Though again, the decision to film the show this way was probably owed more to Parker Lewis being filmed that way than the network wanting to do something bold and original. The downside to this is the show's over-reliance on this god-awful music they seem to use every single time Ferris addresses the audience. I'm Ferris Bueller, and I'm experimenting with the team concept. Life is one damn thing after another. The charge? 
Malicious intent to dance. The verdict. Guilty. But if it's on TV, it must be true. I think it was John Lennon who once said, there's no such thing as talent. Here's a fun fact for you. John Lennon actually came up with that quote after watching an episode of this show. Despite this, NBC even secured a very talented comedy director to helm the pilot, Jonathan Lynn, who had previously directed Nuns on the Run, which I profiled on Almost Cult Classics, and would go on to direct My Cousin Vinny just one year later. Oh, it is a fucking surprise. Beyond that, the casting of Richard Reilly and Judith Kahan as Rooney and Grace are two of the best elements of the show. If this moron of Bueller's wins, you know what that means? It means that you will be so upset you will forget that my birthday is next Thursday and I will think that all of my years of hard work and dedication went right down the toilet. Yeah, okay, but hurry. They have such a natural chemistry that both pays homage to the original characters. Oh, Dad, you sounded like Dirty Harry just then. Really? Uh-huh. But also leaves room for them to explore their dynamic in new ways. Grace? What's that? Well, it started as a bunny rabbit, but now I'm thinking catamaran. No, that sound. Honestly, it makes me wish the show hadn't been a Ferris Bueller sitcom, but rather a Rooney sitcom. It could have been about Rooney being transferred to Santa Monica after the events of the movie, where he struggles to adapt to high school students in 90s California. Oh, what a feeling. He's mine. Another inspired casting choice is then relatively unknown Jennifer Aniston, playing Ferris's sister Jeannie. Of the student cast members, she's the clear standout, and it's obvious why fame was just around the corner for her. Can I borrow your car tonight? No. Oh, why not? Because the thought of you using one of my possessions for pleasure makes me want to puke blood. The remaining cast members, from Ferris's parents to his best friend Cameron and girlfriend Sloane, all do their best with the material, but the characters feel really one-dimensional here. Shouldn't you be wearing pants or something? I spilled my milk. It really makes you wonder how they were able to capture the dynamic of Ed Rooney and Grace so well while completely missing the mark on the others. And occasionally overbearing, which can be adjusted given the right person. I hope you find her. Found her. Cameron, for instance, is nothing like his movie counterpart. I'm not asking you to do it, Oscar. You don't have to clean up. I don't understand Felix's motivation for driving Oscar nuts with his cleanliness. After all, Oscar did ask Felix into his home. God damn it! In the film, he gets probably the most important arc, which makes him a very compelling character. As the events that affect me unfold to determine the course of my life, I'm gonna take a stand. In the show, all of that great character development is thrown away though, and Cameron is just Ferris' friend who contributes very little to the story. There's a whole episode which revolves around Cameron tired of living in Ferris's shadow. The quickest way to earn recognition is through sports achievements. Athletics involves contact with sweaty opponents and the commingling of said juices. You hate that. Now if that was Ferris' friend, this is Cameron Fry. Cameron shied away from the spotlight and never came off as jealous of Ferris, adding a unique balance to their friendship. It's why their relationship worked so well, though it was also enhanced by the chemistry of the actors who had worked together before, something that's really missing here. You wouldn't listen to me, Bueller. All I wanted was a nice, quiet birthday, and you have to throw me the Rose Parade. Most people would want that. It's the worst thing you could have done. Sloane is also nothing like her movie counterpart. The series starts with Ferris meeting her for the first time. Hey, by the way, I'm Ferris Bueller. And you are... Bueller. Which is set up in a way that could be interesting. Maybe we'll gradually get to see their relationship unfold over the first season, with Sloane going from this uptight workaholic to a more laid-back person with the help of Ferris, having their romance gradually blossom... Oh, wait, no. She's already kissing him in the pilot. Bueller. Sloane has aspirations to be a dancer and wants to transfer to art school, which Ferris wants to thwart and goes through a series of ploys to get her stuck at their public high school, even hacking into the waitlist to bump Sloane down a few spots. Guess what Mr. Rooney did? Got me into the performing arts high. Oh, that's great. Maybe we should talk about it. Not now, I gotta call my mom. And we're supposed to root for this guy? I'm gonna give my art everything I've got. But what if everything you've got isn't enough? Pardon my French, but you're an asshole. Bueller! 
This brings me to my biggest problem with the show, how utterly unlikable Ferris Bueller is. I call it Sloan. Simple, yet a living tribute. Get off my property or I'll let the dogs out. Actor Charlie Schlatter does a pretty good job in recreating the mannerisms and delivery of Broderick's portrayal. Well, I happen to have a lot of fun. You mean besides gravitational? He manages to bring all of the snarkiness that Broderick brought to the role with none of the charm, though. He's not entirely to blame for that, as it's the writing here that just makes the character so unlikable. You couldn't buy me a slice of pizza? I'm watching your cholesterol. The sitcom basically negates the purpose of the movie, because Ferris Bueller's high school life is seen as such a breeze that he wouldn't even need to take a day off. He basically gets away with murder here, and has Rooney wrapped around his finger at every turn. Please, please don't do this to me! The school board will be there! The press is coming! I'll look like a fool in front of the entire community! Ferris's knack for hacking is also taken to the extreme here. In the movie, he's able to use his computer to get into the school database to change how many days he's been absent. But here, he's basically a spy, as he manages to hack into airline reservations, school wait lists, and even the judicial system. Her bail just went up to $250,000. In one episode, he even has a helicopter take him to school. Need a ride to school, honey? Uh, no thanks. A friend is giving me a lift. Bye. And in another, later episode, he uses this hyper-realistic face mask to impersonate Rooney. I've got the voice down. Now all I need to do is work on his distinctive breath. Did the writers confuse Ferris Bueller with War Games? Giving Ferris this unlimited power is something that the show does wrong from the start, too. I pleaded you down to detention. Alan, I don't do detention. Ferris, it was the best I could do, not being a real lawyer. They don't know that! It's scary. For instance, in the pilot episode, he uses this remote control trapdoor to cause Rooney to fall through a stage during his first day of school speech. And then Rooney just does nothing about it. In another episode, Ferris convinces the football team to adopt the team name Poodles, unless he's unsuspended. And Rooney retaliates by doing nothing. In one of the final episodes, Ferris throws a house party at Rooney's home when he is away for the weekend. But when Rooney catches him, he ultimately does nothing. You're the principal! Do something! That was the genius part of the movie, that Rooney wanted to get Ferris expelled, but he really didn't have the proper evidence to do so. Your ass is mine. Here, Ferris Bueller gives Rooney a never-ending list of reasons he should be expelled. We have not yet begun to fight. Or any other cliché pertaining to a confrontational situation. It kind of makes you feel bad for Ed Rooney. But for once, I'm not the butt of Bueller's sick humor. In the movie, Ferris rebelled against him and the authority at school, but he never tried directly to ruin his life. Ferris's antics may have led to his demise, but all the turmoil that Rooney faced was his own fault for taking his animosity towards Ferris to the extreme. The show basically flips that dynamic. While in the movie, we root for Ferris and enjoy seeing Rooney get his comeuppance, here, Ferris is so extremely unlikable that we want to see him get reprimanded. Because it's always you. It's been you for two years, three weeks, one day, and four hours. Would that be Pacific time? Shockingly, Ed Rooney becomes the more relatable character here. Oh, I've got you now, Bueller. Even the coyote must one day catch the Roadrunner. And not only that, the writers inadvertently suggest that everyone in Ferris's school life would also benefit if he were expelled. You're beautiful too. It's all that ugliness on the inside. It doesn't bring out the beauty on the outside. Rooney would stop losing his mind and getting injured in over-the-top comedic ways, Sloane would get to attend art school and pursue her true passion. Jeannie wouldn't have to deal with her obnoxious little brother at school, and she could pursue her studies. And Cameron would not be stuck in the shadow of his friend. An interesting thing about the movie is that we never really see Ferris at high school. And the show misses a huge opportunity to show the audience why Ferris is so liked amongst his high school peers. Honestly, Ferris Bueller is not an inherently likable character to begin with. But through Hughes's clever writing and Broderick's portrayal, we were able to see the good in the character. The sitcom fails to capture even a fraction of what has made this movie resonate with different generations since the 1980s. They say that every dog has its day. 
except Al Pacino, who had an afternoon. This sitcom is one of countless examples of how lightning in a bottle cannot be replicated. Some lessons cost more than others, but those are the ones that usually turn out to be priceless. And I'm glad since its cancellation, there has never been another attempt to resurrect characters from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Right?